Wonderful. Well, so happy to be here. And um, I love getting to talk about mushrooms. I love mushrooms. Um, I love sharing my interest in fungi with other people. And uh, my kind of training is in plant pathology. And so the overlap there is that uh, lots of plant pathogens are fungi. And some, some plant pathogens uh, that are fungi produce mushrooms. Some fungi in general produce mushrooms. So there's a little bit of overlap there. Uh, but really, I just think they're very cool and enjoy them myself. Uh, so I appreciate the chance to get to share with you all, um, kind of give you a little window into the hidden life of these fungi and the mushrooms they produce. So uh, kind of my goals for today are going to be walking you all through kind of when I get questions about mushrooms, what do they tend to be? Uh, because um, especially right now, you know, it's fall, it's that time of year, lots of mushrooms popping up and lots of mushroom questions. Uh, so I'm going to go through kind of um, what are mushrooms and what are the fungi that produce them doing in the environment and then talk specifically about some of the mushrooms that you're likely to see popping up um, you know what are some different species and how do you distinguish them because what we're not going to do at the end of today is um, be able to walk away from this with like you are now a mushroom expert and you can identify them all and know what to eat and what not to eat. Um, that's not the goal of today, um, but more to provide you with some resources to get you started on the right track, whatever your interests and goals are, whether you're just interested in learning more about identification, um, whether you are interested in foraging or growing your own mushrooms, a little bit more info on what fungi are, what they're doing in the environment. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, I'm, I'm always available to answer other questions. And uh, you know, most of what I do is forest health. So if I don't have the answers to your questions specifically about mushrooms, I'm happy to reach out and connect you to somebody who might. Um, so yeah, feel free to get in touch. So let's start out with what is a mushroom since that's the first word or, you know, the, in the title of today's presentation. Um, what is a mushroom exactly? And so probably most folks are uh, most familiar with the mushrooms that grow like this, right? Uh, the grocery store mushrooms. Um, and this is, might be what most people think of as mushrooms. Uh, but mushrooms in general are the fruiting bodies of a fungus. So their whole goal is to make spores. So in this video, you can see me poking a puffball and it produces spores. That's the whole reason that mushrooms exist is that fungi produce spores and those spores get around and that's how they reproduce and spread. So an analogy would be like a tree. <clears throat> let's say an apple tree. An apple tree is the, you know, the, the body of the organism and occasionally it's going to produce apples that contain seeds that are how new apple trees are made. Um, for fungi, uh, the fungal body is um, hyphae or mycelium. It's this vegetative growing structure that's kind of filamentous and thread-like, um, but occasionally that will produce its fruiting bodies, the, the apples, which are the mushrooms. And they produce these spores that will travel around on the air, in the water, on insects, and I guess on my finger in this picture, <laughs> and produce, you know, germinate where if they land somewhere good and make more fungi. Um, so just kind of a, a comparison there uh, is that when we see mushrooms, what we're just seeing is the fruiting body. We're just seeing, you know, one part of it. So like here's, a, here's another quick photo of <laughs> always fun to kind of poke at these, these puff balls. Um, but, you know, all the different mushrooms that you're seeing are producing spores and they do so differently. And not all fungi produce mushrooms. Some are microscopic fruiting bodies, but they're all going to be producing spores to help them reproduce and get around. So one thing that I'd like to emphasize, and this is applicable whether we're talking, um, you know, just what are these mushrooms that you're seeing in your yard or in the woods or how do you grow mushrooms, is that when you see a mushroom, when you see a mushroom fruiting, um, that's really the fruit uh, and it's what you see and it's what you notice, but it's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Because by far, the greater part of that fungal body is the mycelium. And that's the vegetative part of the mushroom. That's the part that's doing all the eating and the growing. Um, that's the mycelium, it's vegetative growth. And it kind of looks like this. 
Um, now you probably aren't going to see it look like this too often because it's going to be growing under the ground. It's going to be growing in leaf litter. litter. It's going to be growing in a log or um, in the roots of a tree or something like that. So it's not going to be something that you're going to notice. But if you ever kind of peel up layers of leaf litter and see something kind of white and, white and fluffy, or in your garden under mulch, if you see these kind of white fluffy threads, um, that's fungus. That's the fungal mycelium that's growing and it's breaking down your mulch. Um, and occasionally it might produce mushrooms, but it's there all the time, even when those mushrooms aren't being produced, which I think will get into some questions of, I know I've gotten emails that are like, how do I get rid of these mushrooms that are in my yard? And really the mushrooms just come and go, but there's a fungus that's there all the time. That's really, you know, the, the main living organism. So this is kind of another illustration of that. This is another puff ball. But what you can see here that you normally can't really see is that, yeah, you've got this mushroom growing, but I, I kind of chipped off part of the log that it was growing on because this species likes to break down woody material. That's what it's doing. And you can see these thread-like filamentous hyphae that are the fungus um, that's growing in that log, that's breaking down that wood. And um, you know, fungi are like us, they don't photosynthesize. They have to get their food from something else. So typically they're breaking down plant material. And um, so that's kind of what you see here is these, these thread-like structures. So what are these fungi doing in the environment? By far their number one role is they are nature's recyclers. So they feed off of dead material and that could be anything. That could be that log I just showed. Um, that could be uh, an old book. So cellulose, right? So this is a, a fun video. You can find it online of someone growing oyster mushrooms on an old book <laughs> because it's all the same to the fungus, right? Um, it's breaking down that dead material. Um, so they can also, you know, decay plants, uh, but that's all, they're, they're doing really important things in our environment. It can be easy to overlook that, um, but they're recycling carbon, they're recycling these nutrients and making them accessible uh, in other forms. So I think fungi are unique uh, and that not a lot of things are going to be directly breaking down that wood in that same way. And so fungi are hugely important as nature as recyclers in our forest settings. Um, but they can also do other things, right? Uh, so I mentioned I'm a plant pathologist by training and uh, they can be pathogens. They can feed off of living organisms and cause disease and or death. Um, I think of them mo the most in terms of being pathogens of plants. That's probably where my mind is at all the time. And here you can see one, and I've actually got some right here with me. Uh, this is a Ganoderma uh, mushroom, a Ganoderma uh, fruiting body. Uh, artist conch is another name for it. And it's a really common uh, heart rot and uh, kind of rotting the base of the tree and the roots of the tree, um, especially in our area. I see a ton of it on our uh, urban street trees, our oaks, especially if they're already stressed and they're already damaged, um, then they become susceptible to lots of different fungal issues. So uh, Nicole Gauthier and Kim Lamberger have this uh, publication from Plant Pathology that's I think the title is uh, Wounds, like a great invitation to decay fungi. And uh, when we're talking about decay in, in wood, we're talking about fungi. Uh, so that's one particular way that they can be pathogens. Um, and knowing which fungus it is will we'll kind of tell you a little bit about, is this something that's gonna be really aggressive and go rapidly? Or is this just something that's taking advantage of maybe there's a little pocket of dead wood in there? Um, you know, the hard wood of a tree is effectively dead. So maybe it just got in and it's decaying, but it's not really gonna affect the health of that tree. So I have another, another kind of fungal fruiting body right here with me that you've probably seen before. Uh, this is the cracked capped polypore, Philinus robinie, and it grows on black locust almost exclusively. And I, it is hard to find a black locust that does not have one of these on it. Uh, so, you know, is it causing some damage to the tree? Certainly. Is it maybe having some structural issues as it feeds on that? Yeah. But I don't think of it in terms of kind of being a really aggressive pathogen, like I might a Ganoderma root rot or something um, of the sort that I, I would associate with uh, potentially decreasing the vigor of that tree uh, in, the, in the near future. 
But I also wanted to mention that fungi can be pathogens of not just plants, but also of insects. Um, you've got all sorts of different fungi that feed on insects. And sometimes this can look really gruesome, um, like a zombie attack of an insect by a cordycept fungus. Um, sometimes this can be beneficial to us. So using these uh, fungal pathogens in control of insects, they can also be pathogens of humans or animals, and we are no exception as humans. If you think of things like a uh, ringworm or dandruff, fungi play roles in that as well. Um, so, you know, fungi need to eat just like us. So sometimes they're eating dead material, like I mentioned with nature's recycler. Sometimes they're eating living material. And then sometimes they have these really interesting and intimate relationships with other living organisms that's Kind of a net positive to both. So instead of being a living re a relationship with a living organism that's hurting that living organism, it's actually helping it. And uh, those are called mutualistic relationships. And so the most well-known example, I think, are mycorrhizal relationships. And if we're talking about the forest setting, um, then these are going to be fungi that live in and on the roots of trees. Uh, the fungi are getting energy from the trees. You know, they're photosynthesizing and they're providing some of those that sugars to the fungus. Um, the fungus is then in turn providing nutrients to uh, the tree, uh, increased root surface area and access to more water and more nutrients in the soil. And these relationships have found to be hugely beneficial to plants um, in, in all contexts from the forests to your fields. Uh, so those mycorrhizal relationships are really key, but fungi also have a lot of different uh, mutualistic relationships with plants um, from being endophytes, actually living inside of those plants. Um, they have mutualisms with other organisms. So if you think about lichens, which is this photo right here, lichens are a mutualistic relationship between an algae and a fungus. Um, there are mutualistic relationships between fungi and insects. Um, some insects are, you know, the original farmers, they actually farm fungi. So ants, termites, um, uh, different types of uh, uh, ambrosia beetles. Uh, they're bringing these fungi with them and uh, have these really close relationships with them. Uh, so just a little bit of background on what are these fungi doing in the environment? But I bet if you're here today, um, maybe some of you are interested in this, but I bet a lot of you, what you're here for, what you're interested in is how do I know what these mushrooms are? There are so many different mushrooms and you're trying to figure out uh, what are these species that you're seeing and how do you distinguish them? And maybe for some of you, how do you eat them? And I'm gonna just get that out of the way is that as an employee of the University of Kentucky, I do not advise on edibility. There are um, entirely too many different factors going on there. Uh, from the challenges of identifying something that I don't have in front of me to individuals having different allergic reactions to the fact that if a mushroom is growing, you know, something that's contaminated, it could make someone sick even if it's otherwise healthy. Um, and I don't provide that service, but what I do like to do is to help people identify for themselves different species. And if that's something they're interested in, uh, connect them to the resources so they can make their own informed decisions. So what we're gonna do for the rest of this time is to talk about my biggest mushroom ID tips uh, for everyone that's out there. And I'm sure that many of you have a lot of mushroom hunting experience. Um, some of you might not have any, but are interested. And probably most of you have, have thought about this a little bit and looked into this some, um, but wanna learn more. So that's my goal is that we're gonna talk about, you know, what are, what are my tips for beginning mushroom ID? Where to get started? So uh, my very first tip would be to learn the basic characteristics that are important for mushroom ID. Because a lot of times when I get a picture of a mushroom, it's from the top uh, and it might tell me a little bit about that mushroom, but there's a lot of different characteristics that I use to determine what a mushroom is to species. And a lot of those you can't see with just a photo of the mushroom on the top. So I'm just gonna kind of walk through the parts of a mushroom and how you use those for identification. So what are the parts of a mushroom? So this is just kind of like a generic uh, illustration of a mushroom. You have, and not all mushrooms, not all fungal fruiting bodies look anything like this. Some look really weird and different and we'll talk about those. But in general, you have a cap. On the underside of the cap, you have some kind of structure that that 
mushroom is using to get spores out. It might be gills. Now those are what you think of and mushrooms you get from the grocery store. <clears throat> They're gonna have these blade-like gills on the underside. But that's just one of the many different ways that fungi can produce spores. Fungi are incredibly diverse and there's so many different species. And so we'll, we'll see some of that diversity today. Um, you also need to look at the stem of the mushroom. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different characteristics about the stem, whether it's um, the texture of the stem. Sometimes they'll have different features on them, like this one has a ring. Uh, sometimes the base of the stem will have really different features. It might be swollen, or it might have a root on it, or a root-like structure, um, or it might have look like it's hatched out of a little um, bulb at the base. And I'll show you some photos of those different things, but all of those are really important for figuring out what you have. Way more important than what's the color of the mushroom, which unfortunately frequently is not very helpful. Uh, so here's an example of like a cap. What does a cap look like? A beautiful little, little um, hygrosity. And look at this tiny little um, point at the end of the cap, uh, you know, very distinctive shape. But, and, and you know, they might have these different features, like they have this hair extending from them or different scales on them. But if you send me a picture of like of this or this, it's really hard to know where to go from there because what I really want to know is what's underneath that cap. Um, that's the most distinguishing part. And like, for example, here's, here's a, a two mushrooms that were growing right next to each other. From the top, they look identical. But if you were to look underneath on the side, they look very different. So one has gills, like you think of, and this one has teeth an entirely different type of structure that a lot of mushrooms will also have, um, especially some mushrooms that people enjoy eating. So just to kind of show you that the top of the mushroom really doesn't tell you too much about it, you need to see all of these other structures. You can be easily confused. And things like this is why it's so important to identify every single mushroom that you see to species. Um, there's no one size fits all rule for what, what's good to eat, um, what'll make you sick and what won't. You've really got to identify every one of those to species confidently. And here's another example when we talk color, you know, both of these have this, this beautiful uh, orangish yellow color, um, but this one is a bolete and it has pores instead of gills on the underside like this one does. Uh, so these are all super important for narrowing down to different species. So <clears throat> what's under the cap is very important. Is it gonna be something like gills, like this beautiful blue lactarius? Um, and is it gonna, instead of have gills, have more like raised ridges? So this, you could easily confuse with gills, um, but did you see how these are blade-like? And you could break them off if you had this in front of you, you, you could kind of separate that gill really easily. Um, this isn't like that. Uh, they kind of look like gills, but they're, they're much more shallow and they're not going to have that blade-like um, texture. So this is chanterelles, and instead of having gills, they have these uh, raised veins or ridges underneath that kind of look a little gill-like, but aren't. Um, some have teeth. This is a northern tooth mushroom that has lots and lots of teeth and real fleshy character, um, and some will have pores. And the, the nature of all of those things is very important for identification. And I'll show you just a few examples, um, but just to get you aware of some of these different differences um, in different uh, uh, groups of mushrooms and different um, genera and different species. So one of the key things is kind of, if I'm talking about what's under the cap, um, in some gilled mushrooms, uh, those gills will stop short. Do you see how these gills don't quite make it to the stem? They stop short. That's called a uh, free. Those are free gills. And that's characteristics of some groups of mushrooms. Uh, whereas these, these are the chanterelles again, and they're not true gills, but they run down the stem. And that's called decurrent. And so those are kind of just one of the many different kind of features that you would look for in terms of gills. Other things you might look for would be how crowded are those gills? Um, do they do anything different or weird? What's the texture of them like? Are they shaggy? And this is even before or we get to things like microscopically what's happening on those gills because while I'm giving you some general tips it's it is important to know that sometimes without uh, microscopic work um, you're not going to be able to get to species um, but you can still narrow it down and get to general groups so 
What's the stem like? We talked about some of those different stem characteristics, but here's a couple different photos that show a ring on a mushroom. And this one right here is one of our most deadly mushrooms. Um, this is the destroying angel, which just a few bites of it can kill you. And um, many, but not all, of the mushrooms in this group, the Amanita, have rings around them. So it's something to, to really be aware of. But so do other mushrooms. Uh, so it's not kind of a, a, a guaranteed way to determine anything. It's just one of the many characteristics that you can use to figure out what something is. Um, another one about the stem is what does the base of that stem look like? Again, these are all Amanitas. So these are all in that same group that I just showed you with the most deadly poisonous mushrooms that we have. Um, they all kind of hatch out of these little egg-like structures. Um, so you might see this sack type of thing at the base, a bulb. Um, you might not. Uh, so sometimes those will disappear the older they get, or maybe it'll just be big and swollen, or maybe it'll be really shaggy. And there are different ways that it can look. And one of the challenging things that I'd say is that you can, uh, you can know this about this mushroom and you might run across one like this. So do you see a bulb at the base? And I've already dug into there some, you can see where I was digging because I was like, I, I'm pretty sure this one is an Amanita, but we can't see it. And so it was buried underground and it would be so easy to ask to, to pick this and not see that. Um, so you really got to do your research uh, when you're when you're trying to identify these mo different mushrooms. Um, you know, look through all of the different interesting features that they might have. And so some other ones that are kind of interesting and different would be, I mentioned that some of them have that little ring around the cap. Now that's because when those caps emerge, they have this veil on the underside. And sometimes that veil is kind of thick, uh, like those rings I showed earlier, but sometimes it's really cottony. Uh, like this one. This is a Cortinaria species and it's going to expand out and those those kind of cottony fibers are going to be pulled. When it fully expands, you're not going to see this at all. Um, maybe, maybe you'll see a little bit of evidence of it around the stem. Maybe you won't. Uh, so this is the kind of thing where like if you don't see this in just the right life stage, you wouldn't notice that. Um, you still might get to it being a Cortinaria uh, mushroom for other reasons. Um, but if you see this, it's like, oh, okay, I definitely, I know what that is. Um, and you can kind of, uh, there's a lot of different features like that that are all going to combine together to give you um, an identification. So more about the stem. It might have a really interesting pattern like this. Uh, look at this one. This is actually an Orobolitis, a uh, type of, of, of poured mushroom. So it's got pores on the underside instead of gills or teeth. Um, but wow, look at the, the ornamentation on that stem. Isn't that interesting and distinctive? So another really, really, I can't emphasize this enough, really important feature that's useful in mushroom ID is spores and spore color. And if you're remembering that video of me poking that mushroom, you might wonder, well, how on earth are you going to know spore color? Because those spores um, are released and then they float away. And um, how could you know that? And the truth is, most of the time in the field, you're not going to know it. You can make some guesses, or maybe if you're really lucky, you can kind of see where some of it has landed. Um, but most of the time, you don't know it. Um, so you need to bring those mushrooms back and you take what's called a spore print. So that is that you would take your mushroom, you might put it on a sheet of paper. I like to use sheets of paper that are both um, dark and light colored because sometimes the spores are white and sometimes they're a dark color. And if you were to put your um, a, a mushroom with white spores on a white paper, you might not see it. And if you put your uh, mushrooms with dark spores on a dark paper, you might not see it. But if you put them on paper that has both of those colors, you will. Uh, or you can put it on like aluminum foil or something else like a blue colored paper. Anyways, um, put them on a, a sheet of paper, cover it with something like a bowl, and then leave it there for a few hours. A lot of times I'll set this up in the evening and check it in the morning. And um, if it's a fresh mushroom, you should be able to see, not always, but you should be able to find a spore print. And it might be nice and white like this one. This is a portabella. You can see just how dark and chocolatey brown those spores are. And that is hugely important because there are major differences. Um, you know, does it have white spores or does it have brown spores? Does it have pink spores? Does it have green spores? Um, that will take you in different directions if you're trying to identify mushrooms. And a lot of the keys and guides, that's going to be the first thing that they ask, um, which is kind of tricky because you don't know that 
that just right off the bat. You've got to do a little bit more detective work. Now, if you're getting into microscopy or using a microscope to identify any of this, um, those spore differences, there's a lot of different things you can see under the microscope as well that might not off the bat tell you what something is, but will definitely, um, as you're working through a key, uh, answer some questions like, do these spores have lots of ornamentation on them or are they smooth and different things like that? So another thing to think about is, is there anything else distinctive about these mushrooms? And there's lots of distinctive things about mushrooms. I'm just naming a few, um, but there's, there's lots of kind of uh, common things that I would also look for. Things like, does it bruise or change colors when you cut it or touch it? So this is a bolete, uh, which is one of the pored mushrooms. And I don't know if you can see in this picture, but I think it's really cool. Because when you look at that surface, what you see all of these tiny little dots, these pores. But what's actually there are these long tubes that have those spores on the inside. In this photo, you can really see it really well, right? But um, many boletes and, and other mushrooms as well um, will stain when you cut them. And this one's staining this kind of purpley color. Um, I just cracked it open and you can see that staining started right away. Um, some might stain immediately, a dark, dark color. Like I can, you can write little messages on the underside of them. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but that's distinctive. Any bruising or a color change, right? That's something worth noting. Um, another thing would be liquid when cut. So check out this video right here of me. Uh, can you see that liquid? So I just cracked those gills a little bit. And what you see is that liquid is kind of oozing out of those cut surfaces. Um, so that right away off the bat is leading me towards that and some other features. A lactarius or a similar species um, that, you know, the name lactarius uh, um, latex, they're oozing this liquid um, when they're cut. Um, other things would be things like smell. Um, so I've heard a lot of times, and honestly, my, it, this is a subjective one. What smells like one thing to one person might not smell like the same thing to another person. Um, but a lot of people will say that chanterelles smell like apricots, that um, uh, pheasants backs or dryad saddles, uh, which you may see popping up right now, um, smell like watermelon rind. Uh, that, uh, oh, I just found one uh, last week that had this incredibly intense smell of cucumbers, uh, a tricholoma. Um, it just, you know, really smelled like cucumbers. Uh, so, you know, those are other things to consider. Um, a couple other things, I don't know if you can tell from these photos, but maybe this one right here, do you see that slimy stuff between my finger and the cap? So some of them are completely covered with a dense snot-like slime. Um, but if you touch them, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll feel it. Um, and sometimes that can be environmental, like if it just rained, uh, but sometimes it's really characteristic to different types of mushrooms. Um, so other things to consider. Another thing that's really important that um, a lot of times when you're, when you're taking photos and you're trying to get an ID, people forget to include is where was it growing? Like a picture of it growing in the environment where you found it. Was it growing in a yard? Was it growing as these two are um, directly from woods on, uh, wood on logs, uh, dead logs? Um, was it growing on a living tree? Uh, what type of tree was it? <laughs> in this case, was it, um, so uh, chicken of the woods is a popular edible. Um, you know, what kind of tree was it growing on? Was it growing on a hardwood? Was it growing on a softwood? Was it growing next to or near an oak or a maple or, you know, you get the picture. All of these are uh, really useful because some mushrooms are generalists and they'll grow in a lot of different places, but others are very specialized. So this past spring, I got a lot of photos and questions about um, this bolete that, that grows near ash trees. And so, you know, that was the very distinctive. It was like, oh, is this growing at the base of an ash tree or near an ash tree? If so, you know, consider this species. Um, so good things to note. Another thing I really wanna mention is um, how was it growing? Are these just kind of individual mushrooms on the forest floor? Or is this a big cluster of them, like a big clump of them all together? Um, and that's very important, especially for some species. So um, this is when, uh, this is a, photo that I'm going to illustrate something. Um, I googled chanterelles and this is the image that came up. 
Now, I don't know how many of you have already mushroom hunted a little bit and uh, know something about this, but I can tell you right off the bat, this is not a chanterelle. This is, in fact, a lookalike that is poisonous and would make you quite ill if you ate it. But nonetheless, this comes from an article, Wild Chanterelle Mushrooms Offer Pickers a Delicious Find. No, no, you do not want this one. Um, and I can tell you that for a couple different reasons, but the first one is that it's this huge clump of them. You don't find chanterelles growing like that. This is a jack-o'-lantern, um, and you frequently find them in huge clumps at the base of trees. That's another thing. It's right at the base of a tree that you can see it's kind of dead. It's got lots of insect holes. Um, another thing about this one, I mentioned it has the decurrent. Um, it's going down the stem, which is good, like chanterelles do that. Um, but these are real gills. You know, those are, those are blade-like gills, and chanterelles don't have those. There's a whole other list of characteristics that I would use to distinguish every single time, even though at this point, you know, I've hunted chanterelles many times, every single time I would make sure that it meets my checklist of all of those different things. Um, and this is a dead giveaway. If they're growing in a big cluster like that, you do not have a chanterelle. Um, so something to consider. This is, this is the densest that I would ever see them grow, these chanterelles. Um, this is very dense for them, but even that, they're growing kind of singularly along the forest floor. They don't have those really blade-like gills. Um, they do go down the stem, but if you were to break it open and cut it, you'd also find that the flesh is white, um, unlike the orangish flesh of the jack-o'-lantern, the poisonous uh, look-alike. Um, the smell is different. Uh, there, there's, there's a number of differences that you could find between those two. Um, so I also want to mention that different life stages of the mushrooms can look radically different. Um, and that makes ID real tricky because if you just have one, it's hard to know what is it going to look like throughout its life. So like this, this mature um, mushroom, and I say mature mushrooms, they don't last that long, right? Most of them, unless we're talking about one of the ones like these that are going to be perennial uh, woody mushrooms that grow on trees and logs, most of them come and go pretty quickly. Um, but one of these kind of older mushrooms, it's kind of reflexed out and its gills are fully exposed and they're kind of almost a dark color, a, a chocolatey color, a rusty brown color maybe, um, versus these younger specimens of this Portnerius that have that cottony webbing um, covering the gills, but the gills themselves are this beautiful purple color, you know, um, which is very different from how it looks in this older stage. And another one I really want to mention are the Amanita species because they do contain some of the most poisonous mushrooms um, that we will ever see here that could kill and do kill people. Um, I mean, they also contain some that people do eat. In my opinion, those, <laughs> those are real advanced mushrooms because you do not want to confuse them. Um, but they, they start out in this little egg-like form. And if you were to cut it open, you would find the outline of a mushroom. Now you might confuse it with a puff ball at this stage because it looks like a little egg, but there's a, a mushroom on the inside. And then it kind of grows out of that um, into more of a typical mushroom shape. And by the time it's like this, you might not even see this bulb at the base if you weren't looking for it. So something to consider. Um, so first check on our beginning mushroom ID tips, learn basic mushroom characteristics important for ID. Done, we've got that right. <laughs> So it's just a starting point, and there's so many more, but just to give you an idea of what, what are some of the things that you'd want to look for. Um, so second on my list would be to learn to recognize common groups of mushrooms. So this will help you to kind of narrow things down or get an idea of what are the key characteristics that you need to use to distinguish some of these different groups. This is also the time where I get to show lots of pretty pictures of different mushrooms that grow in our area. Uh, so these are some mushrooms that you could easily uh, stumble into in our woods and uh, or, or you might have already found this year hiking around. So let's start with the guild mushroom. So there are many, many, many different species. Um, fungi are hugely diverse and we're only scratching the surface on the great diversity that is there with fungi. Um, 
but they include things like the Amanitas that I mentioned. And this is a photo of that destroying angel, that super poisonous one. Now these will also contain, these are kind of the mushrooms you think of, like the little children's mushrooms. And we don't, we don't have mushrooms that, that grow, uh, we have the species, but it looks a little different here. Instead of being red, it's a yellowish color. Um, now these have a different set of uh, toxins in them that'll make you feel very, weird and sick in other ways. Um, this one will cause liver and kidney failure. Um, mortality rate is extremely high and there's no good treatments for it other than a liver kidney transplant. Uh, so things that you do not want to mess with and you do not want to confuse. Um, other guild mushrooms that are really common would be like inky caps. And I included these photos because they might start out looking like this kind of shaggy, um, but then they get their name, inky cap, because they melt, they deliquesce, it's called, which is a fabulous word. Um, and they melt and their spores are black and it's this mess of black, uh, you know, slimy spores. And this happens really fast. Um, so if you've ever seen these in the landscape, you'll know that this is just a, you know, short period of time later, you're left with kind of an inky mess. Um, so the inky caps, uh, lactarius, and I showed a different one of these earlier, I think, um, but they're the ones that are producing that, that uh, liquid uh, when you break those gills, and you can see that oozing out when I've done that, but they have a really chalky texture otherwise. They have these nice uh, gills, pretty crowded gills, um, and you'll find them all over, and there's lots of different species of lactarius. Um, the Russula is, is related to those Lactaria species in that it's got a really similar form. You can kind of see they look a little bit alike, but they don't, aren't going to produce that milky, um, you know, exudation when you cut them. And one thing that I always use to, to teach people Russulas is that when you break them, let's say you break the stem, it breaks cleanly like chalk. It's got this very distinctive texture. And you'll find lots of these little red russulas around um, as well as other species. And they have a white spore print and there are some other things that you can use to distinguish them. And I've shown you lots of different pictures of chanterelles, but I put them in here as gilt-ish mushrooms, right? Because you could easily think that they have gilt, but, but gills, but the, the more you get looking at mushrooms and the, the more familiar you get with um, identifying some of these, you'll, you'll see that you're like, oh, these aren't, these aren't really gills. These are just uh, raised veins. And they don't really look the same if you compare that to this, you know, it's a really distinctive and different. Um, and these are smooth chanterelles, so there are many different species of chanterelle also. Um, so these smooth chanterelles, this is especially true for, right? <laughs> I'm showing you the most extreme example, uh, but there are some others that, that maybe are more gill-like, um, but just one thing to note. And then you can have mushrooms with pores. And again, there are many different species of mushrooms that have pores, um, whether we're talking about boletes, that you would look at them and you'd see them from the top and they would look like a normal mushroom. And then you flip them over and it's like there's a little sponge on the underside, this, this very thick, uh, fleshy, spongy uh, surface right here. And in that earlier photo I showed what those actually are, you're going to see the pores, but it's actually those tubes um, that the spores are coming out of. Um, so lots of boletes and close relatives in this group. Um, uh, I think this is actually a pilopolis, uh, but, but lots of different ones. Um, uh, polypores or bracket fungi or conchs. You'll hear these referred to as all sorts of different names. And they're the ones I've been showing you over here. Here's another, another fun one. And the reason why um, I have all of these here with me right now is that unlike a lot of the other mushrooms that I've shown, these preserve really well. So like, I don't know if you can hear that, but it's got this really woody texture. Um, and it will preserve well, and you'll find them, uh, whereas lots of these mushrooms are very ephemeral. They come and they go. Uh, these might stick around a little bit longer. Now, there are very fleshy polypores as well, but a lot of them have that woody um, characteristic that really make them different and something that you would see all year round because they, they fruit and they're produced, but then they stick around a little bit longer. So here's one that I showed earlier in that same group, the Ganoderma or our artist conch um, fungus. And uh, I, I've included this photo because this is how it's growing on a downed log that I found. Um, but the polypores, the pore part of it, is that if you look at the underside, 
what you see are these tiny, 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 tiny little pores. And you probably need a hand lens on this particular one to actually see them, because I'll show you the underside of this. I mean, you're not going to see those pores necessarily, but if you had a little magnifying glass, you could probably see them. Now, to contrast to that, um, you know, the, the size, the shape, the structure of those pores vary. If you're looking at something like this, those pores are going to be much larger. Uh, so, so there's a lot of variation there with the polypores. Um, another kind of common polypore are these turkey tails. Or they're, um, you might see these. There's a lot of different look-alikes too. Um, but you'll see these all over. They might be about this big and kind of covering a log. Lots of these different fruiting bodies that are all overlapping and next to each other. But one of the key things for a true turkey tail uh, to bring you into that Trimedes uh, group uh, the genus that it's a member of, is that if you were to flip it over, on the underside you would see pores. Now if you, there's others like the false turkey tail, that if you flip it over it's going to look totally smooth. The top could look exactly the same, but the underside is key. So again, uh, when you want uh, mushroom identification help, the underside and the many different features that are involved in that, for, from the top it's really hard to distinguish them. Um, but you can kind of see here, this group has a lot of different, the Termites, a lot of different uh, uh, similar fungi, uh, and, and some of them are really hairy. Uh, like this one is kind of hairy. You can see those hairs there. Um, there's the pheasant's back or dryad saddle that I showed a photo of earlier. Um, those are those are coming out. I think I think I've seen a few already. Um, but uh, they're more fleshy, so they're not going to be as hard and woody. Um, but they have the the kind of pores on the underside. A chicken of the woods. You can, you can raise your hand if you've found chicken of the woods before. Uh, this is one that is commonly foraged in our area, but I do know people that it, it makes sick. So um, it's not something that, uh, despite being commonly uh, eaten and seen as something that's, that's edible, um, I have uh, talked to many folks who when they eat this, they get quite ill. Um, so just kind of part of the challenge there with mushroom foraging. Um, but we have two different species in this Latoporus uh, genus. Um, some have uh, you know, they both have this bright orange upper surface, which is really cool and fleshy um, with these tiny pores on the underside. Uh, but one has a bright yellow underside and the other has a lighter uh, white colored underside or creamy colored underside. Um, okay, so we talked about mushrooms with pores. How about mushrooms with teeth? And that sounds, maybe sounds a little, a little spooky and weird if you haven't seen them before. Um, but there are things like these heresium uh, species. I don't know if you found any of these before, but they are some of my favorites. Um, so there are several different species of this. They might go by lion's mane or comb tooth or different things. And typically you'll find them maybe about this big or so growing on trees or downed logs. Um, sometimes you'll get lucky and find like a whole lot of it. Um, but these are, these are uh, very distinctive and there's not a whole lot that you can confuse them with because they have these long teeth that are, are extending down, um, very distinctive form and structure, always going to be growing from dead wood. Um, uh, they can look a little different and there are those different species, uh, but that's, that's one that, and I think now's the time for it. So, so go out and check out your woods and see if you see any. I've seen a bunch this fall. And another one that I've seen a ton of this fall that is always a delight is the hedgehog uh, mushrooms. And actually hedgehog refers to many different species in the genus Hiddenum, um, but they all have these little teeth. Uh, so you can see this is a very large one. Some of them are smaller, some species are smaller. Um, they might look pretty boring from the top, right? Like you wouldn't, you'd see that in the woods and be like, meh. I think I'll pass, uh, find something more interesting. But if you flip it over, look at all these teeth on the underside. And I've seen a lot of that this fall as well. Um, so then we've got all this whole series of things that are totally different and weird and interesting. So you might have seen these stink horns uh, popping up in your yard uh, quite obscenely and smelling terrible. Um, but there's many different species of stinkhorn mushrooms. And the reason they smell so bad is that their spores are in this sticky, 
a slimy mess and they're attracting flies uh, to it with that terrible smell. Um, you might see puff balls or earth stars or other um, fungi in those kind of groups. Uh, I think they're beautiful. And I showed you some the videos I showed you earlier of me uh, poking a few things and having spores come out of it. I think it was a, a puff ball and a, um, a calistoma, a, a similar species. Um, but some of these can be huge. You know, you can get the giant puff balls that are huge, and a lot of them are tiny. Uh, and you'll find them all over in the woods uh, or even in your yard breaking down mulch and woody material. Um, rusts. So this is one to look for in the spring. This is looks like orange jellyfish and trees, right? Uh, check your local cedar trees, um, red cedar trees for this uh, uh, cedar apple rust um, that does look really distinctive, very briefly, like the first kind of warm wet day in the spring, and then it's gone for the rest of the year and all you'll see is kind of a little hardened gall. Uh, and really they're not a problem on cedars, uh, but can be an issue on the alternate host of this uh, fungal pathogen, which is like apples and other things, um, other trees in that family. Uh, so uh, you have cup fungi, which have a totally different structure. You know, they don't have the mushroom shape and instead the spores are being formed directly on this surface. Um, early spring when I'm looking for morels, I always find these ones. Um, but we have lots of different cup fungi and some of them are very, very, very tiny. Like these ones, they look so cool with the eyelashes, right? But they're about this big. Uh, so you might miss them, but something to look forward to. These are all ascomycetes, as opposed to most of the fungi we've been talking about so far for basidiomycetes. You have morels, which we love. And I bet a lot of folks on here love morels and have hunted morels. And I'm a terrible morel finder. So, you know, if anybody wants to, to tell me where you find those morels, um, just, just let me know. You know, I'll be, I'll be happy to take them off of your hands. Um, but there's also false morels and other things that can kind of look like this um, that you want to be aware of. Um, then there's so many more. There's bird's nest fungi, which are tiny and make these little, they look like nests almost, and they have little packets of spores that look like eggs. There are coral fungi um, that look like you're in the ocean and they're coral, and these are really common. Um, and we could go on and on about all the different cool types of mushrooms that you see. But just to give you some perspective on that whole diversity. So beginning mushroom ID tips, pay attention to all those details we just talked about and use all of the available resources, online, text, books, people, um, to, to figure things out and learn. Uh, because it's a long process and uh, every year I learn more and more and every year I'm, I'm always amazed by what I don't know and the great diversity of fungi that are out there. Um, but a few resources I'd recommend, there are lots of books and it kind of just depends on what you want where you live and where you're going to be looking for mushrooms. Um, you know, do you want something that's going to be really comprehensive? If you're like super interested in boletes, you know, there are entire textbooks on boletes. But if you're not, then you might be better served by something that's more general and focused to your particular area, wherever that is. Um, and there are different books for, say, the um, Central Appalachians or uh, the Midwest and uh, different things. Uh, one great free resource that I would encourage you to check out is a website called mushroomexpert.com. Now it's a little tricky because it's a dichotomous key. So you'll have to like put on your incredible patient's hat and um, be really ready to, to work for it. But I think it's, it's free and it's easy and it's fun and there are photos. Um, so if you, if you get somewhere wrong, you can kind of quickly figure it out. So for example, you'll be given a series of questions and then they'll try to guide you to the right species. But these keys are rough and I wanna emphasize that they can be challenging. So here's if, you, if you're working through a key that they have for um, uh, guild mushrooms, you might get 41 questions in and it asks you, <laughs> do you meet one of the following descriptors? Are you easily frustrated? Do you not have a microscope? Do you just want to find a good edible mushroom and this isn't it? Are you employed full-time outside of mycology? <laughs> it encourages you to stop right there. And if, if any of these are true, just stop there and call it a terrestrial LBM. And LBM is short for little brown mushroom, the technical term. And then, you know, 10 more questions down. If you say, no, I really want to figure this out. It asks you now, honestly, do you have a family, friends? Why not just stop right here? 
<laughs> which I think indicates the sense of humor that a lot of mycologists have, but also how challenging it can be to identify some of these. Um, so there are also great online communities for identifying mushrooms. There's really large ones that operate at a national scale. There's this website called Mushroom Observer that I think is fantastic for cataloging what you've seen and the mushrooms you've collected, uh, kind of a database of what you've seen. And then here in our area, there's the Bluegrass Mycological Society Facebook page that I encourage you to check out and uh, become a member of and just see what other people are posting and you can post your questions there as well um, and, and kind of get connected to some really enthusiastic and knowledgeable uh, local mushroom hunters. Um, a, a few more tips, a few more resources for you. Undoubtedly, when you're trying to learn mushroom ID, you're going to be taking a lot of photos and you're going to be trying to take your photo and get it to somebody who knows more about mushrooms that can give you some tips. So I wanted to give you a little bit of advice on that. Um, first, take photos that will let you or someone else identify the mushroom. So if you just take it from the top and all you've got is that cap looking down, you're not going to be able to get anywhere. Uh, so you really want to get all of the features. You want to get the mushroom as it's growing in the environment. You want to get the cap, the underside, the base, the stem, um, anything that you could possibly be asked about uh, to identify. You want to also provide any other useful information. How did it smell? What kind of trees were growing around there? Were, were they pines or were they oaks? Um, you know, anything else you can think of that would be useful. And then take it all with a grain of salt, especially if you're posting anything on the internet. Do not trust your life to strangers on the internet um, just because someone tells you that something is edible. You know, I would take any of that as an educational uh, tool, um, not the end all be all, because some of these things are really hard to see. And um, frankly, while you can determine whether or not something's edible, uh, in the world of, of fungal taxonomy and some of these species, there's a lot of change. And what's called one species um, might have shifted and might have changed, especially the common names can vary a lot from region to region. Um, and the scientific names are constantly changing. So I would have patience with yourself and others and don't put yourself in any um, dangerous situations based on what someone's told you who may or may not have the right answers. Do not, and I can't stress this enough, do not eat anything unless you are absolutely certain what it is. Um, it, you just, just don't do it. You can go buy mushrooms at the grocery store. There are great mushroom cultivators. You don't need to risk it. You don't need to risk your family's health um, or your health um, for that, or even just stress about it, to be up all night wondering, oh no, was that really what I thought it was? Don't do it. Um, so a couple more tips. If you can, hunt with knowledgeable people. Go join a foray. There are individuals that you can, um, like paid professionals will take you out with them, but you can also join groups and go mushroom hunting with them. Here's me at one of my big annual forays each year that I tend to go to, not this year, sadly, uh, but most years. And we just go out and pick all the mushrooms we can and then try to identify them all and figure out what they are. And it's a lot of fun and it's a great learning exercise for me. Um, and every time I come away with it knowing way more than I did before. Um, and then hunt for food, not for fun. I recommend if you're just starting out, um, hunt for the enjoyment and identifying and save the, the food for later. Or if you really, really, really are interested in foraging, a few tips that I'd have. Um, don't just pick something and try to figure out if you can eat it. Get to know what the common edibles are in your area that are super easy to distinguish from any potentially poisonous lookalikes. And that way, you know, you'll know exactly what you're looking for. You're not trying to eat everything, um, but just to start out with, find those things that it's really easy to distinguish and be confident in and focus on those. You can still learn about the greater diversity of mushrooms that are out there. I think it's really fun. I think it's kind of like a combination of hunting and a logic problem when you're out hiking of trying to figure out what these mushrooms are. So I highly recommend it. And we've got this publication called Don't Eat Those Wild Mushrooms Unless You Know What You're Doing that walks through some basic principles in foraging if that's something that you're interested in. And then I threw this in here because there, this does vary. Only mushroom hunt where you're allowed. So we're talking about forest mushrooms. Um, uh, federal properties like the Daniel Boone, you are allowed to take um, a certain amount of mushrooms with you. Uh, private property, if you have the permission of the landowner, a lot of the state properties you can't. Um, so just being aware of those regulations wherever you are and only collecting in places where you're allowed to. 
So with that, I want to thank you all and take any questions that you might have. Um, so here I am with the wood ear mushroom. Uh, and you can see why it's called that. It looks like an ear and you'll find these all around. Um, but I'm here if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'm happy to talk or refer you to someone else. Um, so thanks, thanks a bunch for having me.